How much meat could a hippo eat if a hippo could eat meat? That is the topic of today's video. We're going to cover carnivory and hippopotamuses, touch briefly on sexual dimorphism, and go into depth about how anthrax and carnivory in hippopotamuses are related. Hippopotami? I don't know. Leave it down in the comment. I'm going to call them hippos. So this video comes from this paper that I found a few weeks ago titled Carnivory in the Common Hippopotamus, uh, Hippopotamus Amphibious Implications for the Ecology and Epidemiology of Anthrax in African Landscapes. Um, so this was a really cool paper. I forgot how I found it. I think it was just going on a deep dive about carnivory or possibly about hippos. But it brought up something really interesting. And it's the fact that hippos eat a lot more meat than we as previously assumed. So uh, we, we know that hippopotamus, uh, hippopotami, they have a picture right here, uh, they are classical examples of large African herbivores in that same realm as rhinos and, and, uh, and elephants. But they are quite different. And we can see those differences represented quite well in the phylogeny. I think a lot of people's first assumption when it comes to hippos is that they are more closely related to species like rhinos and elephants, because while well, they're all large herbivores found in Africa. But that is not actually the case, because hippos are more closely related to the cetaceans, so your whales and your dolphins. And so we'll represent that with a phylogeny that looks like this. So this does have downstream effects for their fundamental biology. We can look at their ancestry to figure out, well, what are they actually most similar to? And so if we go back to this paper, oops, apologies, that's not the paper. Um, Here we go, here's the paper. Um, what we find is a deep analysis of the hippos. So hippos are foragers. Uh, they, do, they do consume uh, plant material. I don't want to act like they don't. They, they definitely do. And they are more solitary when they are out looking for food, but they do live in these communal herds. Um, I believe herds are the right one. Um, <clears throat> they are highly gregarious and territorial in their diurnal aquatic habitats. We'll go with that. But there have been instances in the past of hippos feeding on carcasses uh, of animals killed by uh, members of their herds. So it is herds. Uh, and, and this is not a, a shocking revelation by any means. Many, many herbivores are known to eat other animals. Uh, maybe not all the time. There is this concept called faculative herbivores or faculative re really anything. Um, if we break it down into obligate and faculative, obligate means, let's actually go back so we can write this down. So obligate would mean that it is required. So let's do it here. So obligate means it is necessary. That's probably a much better word. Uh, we, I will not spell anything correctly. Uh, we are obligate oxygen consumers. We need oxygen to live. But the other thing that we can have are faculative traits. Uh, we, as human beings, are, are a bit faculative in our diet. Uh, we do know that some people are vegan and vegetarian, so we uh, faculatively eat meat. You can have a diet that is entirely absent of meat and be nutritionally uh, adequate. Of course, you need to make sure you're eating the proper nutrients, eating the proper food. There's a lot of dietary issues within uh, plant-based diets. Um, but we are not faculative in terms of uh, um, let's let's write this down as optional. We are not faculative uh, herbivores. We we do need plant material at some level. That's why people who do the all carnivore diet they typically have major health problems, right? And it's it's nothing against meat. Uh, I definitely am not against eating meat. It, it's just that we need certain things. So obligate is necessary. We need. We are obligate. Uh, herbivores slash omnivores, if you want to put it that way, we obligately need to eat something uh, that is plant-based at some level. Maybe not the majority of our diet, but we do need those plants at some level. Uh, of course, that the, 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 muddy, the water gets muddy with us humans because we can always take multivitamins or whatever. Um, but let's go back to the hippos. <clears throat> So they are considered uh, those, those faculative carnivores. They, they will eat meat on occasion, but this paper is saying that it's actually a lot more common than we think. 
Uh, and it also talks about anthrax because anthrax is a zoonotic disease. It affects many, many species. It is found all over the world and it can lead to mass mortality, which actually this paper details in very, very thorough detail about different anthrax outbreaks within hippopotamus. Uh, this is actually a picture of one. Uh, I'm not going to show it too much because YouTube and, you know, it's a bunch of hippos that have succumbed to anthrax. So if we look at this foraging ecology section, it's, it's pretty interesting. So the hippo has almost been universally characterized in the scientific literature as an herbivore and grazing specialist whose diet consists mainly of grasses with aquatic macrophytes. Um, so when it says specialist, that typically means they are obligate. Again, going back to obligate facultative, meaning they need this in order to survive and that it would be true. But if you look at some, uh, if you actually look deeper into their diet, this paper talked briefly about isotope analyses. They did not do the isotope analyses. This is a literature review, and I want to spend more time on stable isotopes in a different video. Uh, essentially, stable isotopes allow you to test or get an idea as to what level of the food web an organism exists in by comparing different uh, amounts of some stable isotope. Uh, there's different types, so different types of nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon. Um, it depends on the study, depends what you're looking for. But they are showing uh, that they do have differences in what they eat. And in fact, it's, it actually seems they avoid aquatic plants as a food source, which is pretty interesting, uh, given that they are largely considered an aquatic herbivore, but they don't really eat aquatic plants. So that is interesting. They will eat some, but typically no. Uh, so you can see here they have a dietary carbon, uh, I, th I forget the name of this, I think it's like delta 13, it's not delta, whatever, gamma 13 uh, carbon isotope ratio, uh, it's, it's intermediate. So again, we'll cover that more in depth. But there is a growing number of documented instances of wild hippos feeding on the carcasses of animals killed by other hippos, crocodiles, or other predators, and of animals that have died from natural causes. So based on this sentence, it seems that they are scavengers. Um, they are, they are, uh, they are eating already dead animals. They're eating carrion. And this has also been found in a lot of other animal taxa. They list a few here, such as impalas, elands, elephants, kudus, wildebeest, African buffalo, zebras, uh, and also captive hippos have eaten a wide variety of vertebrate taxa, including pygmy hippos, Malaysian tapirs, wallabies, and flamingos. Um, I, I always don't hold zoo observations in the highest regard, simply because it is such an unnatural condition um, that it, it's, <clears throat> it can be suggestive of some things, but generally speaking, I don't uh, really follow it. When you go into their digestive anatomy and physiology, because, okay, now the, now the, the situation has changed. We know they are eating meat. We know they have consumed meat. But how does that affect in their gut microbe? Because you would assume that their stomach is highly suited to eating plant material. And this led me on a little bit of a rabbit hole. So they first talk about the robust mandible, hypertrophied canine teeth, and a wide mouth gape have evolved under strong selection for use as display organs and weapons for intraspecific dominance fighting and have no primary functions in feeding on plant materials. So, of course, if we look at hippo teeth, I believe this picture... Oh, it does not show it. Uh, let's pull up hippo teeth. Um, so I think we've all seen these pictures of hippo teeth. They have ginormous teeth. I mean, absolutely incredible mouths. Now, I, I did have a little bit of a, an issue here. Um, maybe not even a really big issue. Uh, I, I just generally, whenever I see a claim about an organism being uh, having strong selective pressures or having uh, really any major claim to their life history, and the paper talking about it is from the 80s or the 60s, I do get a little bit... Um, concerned. And, and I'm only concerned because the papers from the 1960s and the 80s, and, and thus their authors, um, they, they just did not have the wealth of tools and information available to us today. I mean, the, the references here from 1982 and 1968, that is 40 some odd years ago and getting closer to 60 some odd years ago. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, just, just take that in mind. But when I looked at these papers, I, I noticed this 
this uh, true claim that the canines and the incisors show well-marked sex differences in the growth rate and size. Um, the marked sex differences in mandible weighted age allows the sex of found jaws to be determined. So basically they're just describing that there are sexual differences or sexual dimorphism between hippos. And the assumption there from this is that they are uh, using it for courtship displays, right? But, 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 if you go one step further, and, and I will preface all of this with, this needs to be looked at way more, this is just very casual observations. Um, sexual dimorphism in canine size is also found throughout carnivores. It's found in 45 different carnivore species, including species like lions. Um, so when, when I see this, that the, the, the conclusion or the, the data is the teeth are different sizes, so the conclusion is because they're an herbivore, it must be for courtship displays. Um, I, I think that's a, it's an adaptationist argument, which we should go into in depth at some point. But uh, I just want to say that it, it, we, we need more information to make those claims. And when we are under, running underneath an assumption of true herbivory in hippos, it's easy to make that claim. But would that claim differ if the assumption was occasional carnivory? And I, I, I don't want to say that these authors are wrong in their conclusions. Uh, I obviously need to look way more into this. But um, yeah, I, I just always take that as a note when the most recent papers on something like this are just from the 60s and 80s, and every paper thereafter is just uh, saying the same thing as well. Uh, so really good master's project if someone wants to do it. I, I, I highly recommend looking into this uh, because there's definite ways to test this. Anyways, um, when we're still still speak, when we are still speaking about hippobiology, uh, they do have a different stomach system that is very different from the from the uh, from the rhinos and the elephants, like we mentioned. Um, so <clears throat> let's also just now hop into carnivory in herbivores, herbivores in general. Um, again, herbivores do eat meat. We 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 know that, um, and the thought is that. The, the, the kind of traditional challenge in our head is that, well, they have these hindgut fermenting, they have these specialized stomachs for breaking down grasses. Um, basically, most of these herbivores of these, uh, these ungulates have a fermentation chamber in their stomachs. Uh, it is a microbio, it is literally just there, it's like a little bioreactor almost, to break down plant material, because plant material can be kind of difficult to break down. Um, that's also why many of these species eat so much plant material on a given day. But we also know that they eat uh, carrion, which are just like uh, carcasses, right? Uh, birds, eggs, fledgling birds, small mammals, and fish. Uh, so, and they've seen that in antelopes, deer, cattle, and in a lot of other uh, species. And many of these groups also eat the placenta after the organism is born. Uh, and there is so much fascinating information here uh, about the how they have anatomical structures to divert milk from the four stomachs that the milk basically doesn't uh, ferment and lead to acidosis, maldigestion, malabsorption, and even death. Uh, and yeah, I just thought it was really fascinating. Apparently this was actually why we used to feed a lot of cattle uh, meat and bone meal, blood meal, other animal tissues, and that it was actually stopped because of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, so that, that mad cow disease, right? Uh, it, it's really interesting. And yeah, I, I just thought this was a really interesting article. It, it, again, it's down in the description. Definitely read it. There's some really interesting things. Um, and it's shown that we know hippos eat other carnivores, or they eat other, uh, they, they are carnivorous. That's what I'm trying to get. But then they went one step further and attributed it to anthrax. They, they added this anthrax connection. So anthrax is a potentially fatal disease. It's caused by a bacterium, uh, Bacillus anthracis, and it's a widely distributed zoonotic disease. And it is, uh, the, the largest outbreaks are more frequently associated with large herbivores and ungulates. So cattle, deer, antelopes, bison, zebras, elephants, hippos. But mammalian carnivore swine and vultures tend to have relatively high levels of resistance to anthrax. And this is because the anthrax can spread through meat. That, that is known. And species, especially vultures, which eat carrion, they are relatively immune to anthrax. It doesn't affect them near as bad, if at all, uh, compared to other species. 
Now, this article does go in depth about different anthrax outbreaks in the hippos, um, but I, I don't want to spend I don't want to tell you, you know, there was an anthrax outbreak in 2002 and 70% died. I, I'm not going to spend all the time on that. But what's interesting is that hippos of the large herbivores actually have higher rates of anthrax outbreaks. Um, and they tend to be pretty, pretty deadly. Uh, may result in, uh, well, among African wildlife, death rates can be 10 to 90% of the populations. But mass, out, mass anthrax outbreaks in hippo populations tend to be associated with dry seasons or drought conditions, when hippos are concentrated in high densities within river channels and lakes, when their perennial surface water is available. So essentially, the dry season causes the lakes and the, the water table to, to dry up so that you have less water. This is where you get these high concentrations of uh, species around the water. And the outbreaks, um, again, they, they just go in depth about all the different outbreaks. I don't want to spend too much time going through it. Um, but the hippos are feeding on the carcasses of dead hippos on several occasions during the dry season. Um, there is this thought that maybe they're only eating other carcasses or other animals during the dry season when resources are inherently more limited. Um, the paper kind of says that's not necessarily the case because they also definitely are carnivorous during the wet season. So... Just keep that in mind. But uh, again, they, they detail all the different anthrax outbreaks, how many, what was the percent mortality, all of that. But this is where I kind of want to draw the nice pretty bow. Mass anthrax outbreaks in hippo populations can occur in the absence of evident contemporaneous anthrax mortality among other anthrax susceptible herbivore species within the same habitat, or asynchronously and at orders of magnitude higher levels than that recorded among elephants, buffaloes, and other anthrax accessible ungulate species within their habitats. What this sentence is saying is that even in the same habitat, at the same time period, hippos have a much, much higher anthrax-associated mortality rate than the other species in the area. And even when it's not at the same time, so that's that asynchronously, they are orders of magnitude higher. So there is orders of magnitude, so instead of 1%, it may be 10%, higher than other species in the same area, which are presumed to also be herbivorous. And the thought is that this is attributed in part to carnivory and scavenging of anthrax-infected animal carcasses by hippos, including, but not limited to, those of dead hippos. So ultimately what this paper is trying to get at is that carnivory and hippos is an inherent dimension of their fundamental ecological niche. That's that literal next sentence. <clears throat> and unfortunately, they don't have enough information to say how much carnivory is going on. They don't have this information in this paper to say, uh, you know, 30% of the hippo diet is uh, based on carnivory or it, it increases dramatically during the dry season and decreases dramatically during the wet season. Um, they don't have that information yet. But it is, it is definitely worth noting that there is probably a lot more carnivorous hippos than we would assume. Uh, and yeah, that relates to anthrax outbreaks. So this was a really cool paper. It was uh, relatively straightforward, which I really like. It was more of a literature review, but literature reviews are so, so important for understanding concepts. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about this video. If you've watched to the end, you're cool as hell. Uh, yeah, like this video, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Do all the things that YouTubers tell you to do. Uh, with that, have a nice day.